Hi everybody. Sorry I can't be there in person, but thank you to Phyllis and Marcus for inviting me and for making it possible for me to uh, present virtually. Today I'm going to be talking about uh, virtual sampling experiments to help us be better at doing <laughs> micro-refuse analysis. Uh, so I think we all understand that micro-refuse is one of those rare kinds of archaeological data that is both statistically robust enough to be valid for most of the analytical techniques we want to throw at it, but also is telling us something meaningful about, you know, human behavior in the past, long-term use of space on living surfaces. And because of that, uh, it's been talked about for a number of years as one of those things that we should be doing. At the same time, it's also viewed as very difficult because there's a lot of it. That's why it's statistically robust, but it's also why it's viewed as incredibly difficult to do and why not as many people have done it as probably should have. It's not a very widely used technique in the discipline at all. So I did a brief survey of published uh, micro-refuse studies. These are some of them journal articles, some of them are theses and dissertations. And I did my best to pull out uh, information about what the sampling units were, what the sample sizes were, how well was you know, the sample coverage at the, at the site, and the total number of samples that were either recovered or processed. Sometimes they report both, sometimes you don't know. Um, so I did my best to find this information you know, from um, pretty much all of the studies that are easily accessible in typical journal and theses repositories. And when you look through this terrible table, basically find that uh, there's no standard at all in terms of the methods that we employ to recover micro-refuse. The only thing that seems to be holding true is that there's an upper limit to the number of samples that can logistically be analyzed. And here, if we look, we have a range from 9 to 100, but the average is close to about 50 or so, plus or minus 25. Um, if we look at the sampling strategies, we have a lot of grid-based methods, some of them full coverage, some of them partial coverage. Some of them are grids, then pseudo-randomly individual squares are picked. Sometimes the squares are square, but not part of grids. Uh, sometimes they're pinch samples. Sometimes the squares are small. Sometimes the squares are big. Sometimes people use their judgment to just pick uh, areas of the, 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 the building or the surface that seem amenable to providing large sample sizes of micro-refuse. And in terms of sample size, we have everything from a couple grams all the way up to five liters of sediment. And that's a huge range. All of that is going to make a big difference on the transferability, the comparability, the robustness of the results of our painstaking uh, analysis of microrefuse in the lab. Um, so what I've done, uh, I know other folks, Phyllis and Marcus, are working on reducing how much pain it takes to sample or to study the samples in the lab. I've start, decided that uh, another approach is to help us be better at sampling. Now, we'll get into why archaeologists are not particularly great at statistical, uh, statistically meaning samp meaningful sampling <laughs> in a minute. Uh, but first, let's introduce the tool that I created to help us uh, hopefully get better at that. I call it TASSEL, the Archaeological Sampling Experiment Laboratory. It's a graphical interface written in NetLogo. You can run it on the web or you can download it, run it locally on your computer. And uh, hopefully you'll see if I pop it up here um, in just a second. There we go. Uh, that it's actually relatively straightforward to, to use and to understand. The first thing you do is just to set up a blank area. We can think of this as a, a floor or a site or whatever. Um, we set up an artifact distribution. And this can be a fully random distribution like so. We can clear out that one or we can set up uh, you know any number of clusters that we want. Initially the clusters are square so maybe we want to shuffle them. So we get uh, a slightly more realistic pattern of artifacts. Once we have an artifact distribution that we like, 
we can set up a, a sampling strategy. We can go with a random sample of n whatever you want. Here is n equals 30. And it shows the little sampling squares. These are our units, whatever they are, 25 centimeters, 50 centimeters, one meter, whatever. You know, it all depends on the density that you set up here. And we'll just hit the display results. The colors change. Red is a negative. Green is a positive. Um, blue is a positive where it's above this density threshold, more than two artifacts in this particular case. And we get some statistics down here. Total number, real total number of artifacts, number of survey patches, extrapolated number of artifacts, the difference between the counts, uh, density estimates, difference in density, positivity rates, all the things that help us know if this was a good sampling strategy or not. We can clear that and instead we can apply a uh, grid-based approach. So here we have a 10 by 10 grid and we can find that now we have 25 patches and we can get our results here. Same deal. All the statistics, all the colors. Alternatively, we can choose to hide some proportion of the artifacts so that we can't see what's below the surface. And in fact, maybe we want to hide even more than that, like so. And we can click this button to judgmentally put down our uh, sampling patches, you know, wherever we want them to be. And so we can put them here or there or elsewhere. Um, sorry, my computer seems to be slow because I'm doing many things. But you can then do the same deal, display your results, and you'll find your, uh, you were way off in this particular case, right? You can show your artifact pattern again, and you can see how you, you can make mistakes that way. So you can use this manually like so, or you can use these uh, checkboxes on the right to sort of uh, set some limits in these sliders and tell it which ones you want it to iterate through stepwise for however many number of iterations. So you can basically do, which I'm about to show you, like 22,000 different <laughs> sampling frames in a matter of 10 minutes or so. It's pretty uh, fast, actually. It runs pretty fast, even on an old laptop like, like this one. So let me go back and talk about those experiments. So I basically compared uh, a cluster distribution to a, a random distribution. Uh, average density would be about one artifact per uh, sample square, 25 artifacts, uh, 2,500 artifacts total. And I did two sets of experiments, one where I basically tried to uh, understand the effect of sample size, 1 to 2,500, in both a random and grid square, square, grid square uh, setup. And then the other one where I tried to look at how good 50 uh, sampling units are between a random and a regular square lattice uh, setup. And if we look at the results, what we're looking at here is the extrapolated number of artifacts on the x-axis and the number of survey patches uh, on the y-axis. So the upper row is 10,000 iterations, you know, between 1 and 2,500 sampling units. And we can see that the greater the number of sampling units, the closer you are to the actual number of artifacts that are there. But we can see that it actually improves pretty quickly and then tapers off for a very long time. So somewhere in this case around oh, 200 or so sample units seems to be about uh, you know, the point of uh, minimal return. And uh, after that, it's just basically incremental improvement with you know, the variation basically becoming smaller. This little green line is our 50 uh, theoretical uh, maximum number that we can handle in our labs. And then the bottom row is showing the variation at about 50, depending on whether it's the random or systematic. And basically what we can see is uh, the cluster distribution certainly has a wider range of error at 50 because there are parts of the, the uh, floor that have no artifacts and that skews the results if you happen to put too many samples there or too many samples in one of the dense areas, it's, a, it's basically going to increase the error. Um, but there's a chance, a reasonable chance of getting it right uh, even at 50. It's not terrible. If we instead look at the density difference, uh, that's basically the extrapolated density minus the actual average density um, per return, uh, and we look at the number of sampling units that uh, you know come back, 
zero versus some other number, whether that's undersampled or oversampled, um, what we can see here is that systematic grids have a much wider spread and random sampling frames are much tighter. Whether that's uh, anywhere between 1 and 2500 in terms of n or just 50n, the random sampling tends to be better and uh, it turns out that it was better um, in general than the systematic sampling across the board. Now all of that follows directly from the expectations of sampling theory. We could have done equations that show exactly that, right? That's all about probabilistic sampling. Um, the takeaways are that we seem to be okay in terms of the number that we can handle for our, you know, at least this kind of density. That might change if densities are lower. Um, and it might, as densities go up, it might be actually that we're doing really good at a, a count of 50. It all depends. Um, one of the things that we can do is use TASSEL to do experiments at different densities with all of these different kinds of sampling strategies. I did not test judgmental, but we could test that with a whole bunch of, uh, you know, we could recruit some of our students and have them judgmentally click around and do that a bunch of times. We can get a statistical understanding of how robust our sampling frame would be given the amount of effort we have to allocate and we can make better informed decisions not only that but it's clear uh, my old thesis advisor master's thesis advisor ted banning has written this article recently sample to death rise and fall of probability sampling in archaeology we don't know what we're doing as archaeologists when it comes to sampling we do what's convenient we do what we have learned we do what's easy and we don't think too much about how it affects our research, but it affects us a lot. If we do the full coverage survey, uh, you know, take the whole grid of the whole floor, take every grid sample, bring it back to the lab, float it, sort it, count it, yeah, we're probably gonna get robust results, but that might be overkill and we're wasting effort when we didn't need to do that much work. And again, microrefuse analysis is already seen as too difficult. On the other hand, if we just pick a small number judgmentally or pseudorandomly, we are probably not getting the kind of result we think we are. We're probably getting, uh, very likely getting meaningless data, or at least data that we can't really do anything with statistically. We have no sense of the range of error involved because it falls into that realm where it could be correct, but it very well could be incorrect as well. So why TASSEL? Well, we need to meet archaeologists where they're at. You know, seemingly arcane probability equations are not going to be used by most people. It's just the way we are as a, as a discipline. Um, but a little video game like graphical interface that can be used in class, but also used to help plan. You can do it on your laptop while you're in the field. You know, let's say you get some information, you've got architectural features, and you get some initial understanding of some of the densities of artifacts on the site. Yeah, use that. Set up an experiment. Run through your possible uh, scenarios given the amount of effort you have to allocate. Where should I put the samples? How should I design the sampling frame? What kind of error should I expect to be associated with the sampling frame that I think I can do? And at least you'll be informed moving forward. So that's the whole point of TASSEL is to essentially take probability theory and remove that sort of cloud of math and theory from it and make it applicable, practicable, uh, simple to use, and easy to get. And for that reason, it's currently uploaded to the ComC's uh, model repository where it's undergoing peer review. And then it will be available for everybody to download open source. If you don't want to download it, I host it on my website. There's a link down there. You can run it through a web interface. It's a little bit more limited in terms of the things you can do, um, but it runs pretty well in a web browser. I've taken care to write a very detailed uh, help section so that hopefully, eventually, that this can be used uh, in the discipline. And uh, if we do employ it, and we all do learn a little bit more about sampling, I think we're going to be happier with the results that we get. And we're gonna see that we can allocate our effort more efficiently, reducing some of the perceived difficulty of doing things like micro refuse, but also increasing the robustness of our results as well. 
So thank you all, and uh, sorry again that I can't be there in person. I hope the rest of the session goes well, and uh, hopefully next year we can all be together again in person. Bye now. <laughs>